Suspect Convictions is sponsored by Simply Safe Home Security. According to the Department of Justice, 2 million homes are robbed every year. That's nearly one every 15 seconds. Protect your home the smart way. Visit simplysafe.com slash suspect to learn more. The streetlights come on. It's getting dark. She's supposed to be home before the streetlights come on. She wasn't home yet, so I'm thinking she's just out there playing with a friend. She never came home. She should be playing with a friend. She should be going to school and enjoying herself. You know, not strangled, murdered, and uh, treated like a piece of garbage. Just seeing her laying there smoldering is tore you up. It's one of those cases that never leave you. And Stanley's making sure of that. There's no doubt whatsoever in my mind or heart that they have the right man. We looked at and or processed 10,000 items of evidence and never found anything that connected Jennifer and Stanley. I mean, I like cheese, but I'm not a rat. I like kids, but not like that. You are listening to Suspect Convictions, a podcast from WVIK and Scott Reeder looking at the murder of nine-year-old Jennifer Ann Lewis and the man accused of murdering her. I'm Lacey Scarmana. As we heard last week, Stanley Liggins has been tried and convicted twice for the homicide, but both convictions have been overturned. He'll go to trial for a third time this May. We began to hear about some of the evidence that pointed to Stanley in the days after Jennifer's death, and then some information that has come out in the years since that seems to point away from him. We'll look at the evidence and the two trials more closely in another episode. But this week, we want to focus on Jennifer. Before her tragic death, she was living with her mom, Sherry, stepfather, Joe, and newborn baby brother, Damien, in Rock Island, Illinois. Sherry still keeps a trunk full of some of Jennifer's favorite things. Let me get this open. But these are all her little things that she collected. The um, Her classmates in school made her cards. And then she got the Bart Simpson family, still with the tags on them. She got them all here. Here's her tennis shoes. This is probably where that thing is. This is her little thing she little, she collected stuff in. I don't know what that is. But she had little pet rock in here and her little knick-knack stuff. Of course, I got her Barbies. She looks at a photo of Jennifer when she was about nine and describes what she looked like. She had brown eyes, brown hair, pretty small. She had teeth like her dad. And she's a little tomboy. Sherry met Jennifer's father, Bobby, in Des Moines when they were teenagers. I went to uh, juvenile home instead of going and staying at home with my aunt and uncle. And I met Bobby there at the Meyer Hall. She had a troubled past. My mother passed away when I was 10. My dad lived in in Germany. He's American. He's just uh, military, retired, staff sergeant, nicknamed Mad Dog the same nickname I had when I was in junior high school. Looks like Colonel Sanders from Kentucky Fried Chicken. (laughs) And Sherry's relationship with her father can be a bit perplexing. Scott asked her about their relationship. I don't know how to tactfully ask this, but this is mentioned in a report uh, that I got from the Rock Island Police. Your your dad was also your uncle? Yep. Your your mom's sister or your your mom's My grandma's brother. Your grandma's brother is my dad. And your grandma's brother was your dad. My mom and my dad, I guess my mom didn't know this, they fell in love, wanted to get married. Grandma wouldn't let him get married. So he, he your, went back. your mom fell in love with your, her mother's with brother. Her, her uncle. After her mother died, Sherry went to live with her aunt and uncle. My uncle was an alcoholic, and I guess... I was a teenager and things I didn't approve or appreciate and I ran away and I went to uh, juvenile home. Cindy Hardy was a social worker who met with Sherry during that time. Very pretty girl. Thin. She had particularly thin wrists and hands, I remember that. 
I don't know why I remember that. Beautiful girl. And I, I, I knew her pretty well because I believe I was residential coordinator at that time. So I would be above her counselor. Sherry and Bobby met at this runaway home. Remember him telling me that if I didn't have sex with him, he was going to leave me in the next following year. I ended up pregnant with Jennifer. And we moved to Minnesota. Scott reached out to Bobby, but he said he didn't want to talk about Jennifer. After he hung up and he didn't want to talk, what I did is I hunted down a column I'd written on the uh, case several years before, and I texted the column to his phone number and just said, hey, take a look at this. He didn't want to talk on the phone, but he did send me some text messages back. You're not being fair to me by bringing this shit back up in my life. Fuck you and anyone from Iowa. That's why I left it. I wanted Jennifer to come and live with me, but I didn't get custody of her in the state of Iowa. She would be alive today. Fuck you and fuck Iowa. I wasn't a perfect kid, but after Jennifer was born, I went back to school, got my GED, tried to join the Army at 17, completed a job training program through the state of Iowa, all because I wanted to be a better person for that little girl. Neither my family nor the state of Iowa even give a crap. The picture that is enclosed is one that I cherish, which makes me wonder if I'm the only one that has baby pictures. That's all I have for you. I don't want to revisit this anymore. Sherry says Bobby never tried to get custody. After they broke up, she and Jennifer moved back to Des Moines. She says Bobby visited a few times, but she hasn't seen him since. Not even when Jennifer died. When she was killed, I called him. He said, oh, she's just probably just playing with a friend. He didn't come to her funeral. Sherry says she did the best she could as a parent. Back in Iowa, she married a man named Gene Cook. But things weren't much easier during this relationship. Jennifer Priest, the manager of the apartment complex Sherry and Jean lived in, remembers meeting them. It was real development, farmer's home. So they came in and they had nothing. And so I just felt so sorry for that little girl that I, I sent them to an agency to get their deposit. And they were able to get it. And then they got on the low rent program. And they just had nothing when they came. So I had gone out to my church because I was the head of the food bank that we had there. So I went and got them some food and took up to them. And I have had a, a garden and I had, I picked a big bag of green beans and took up to them. And I'll never forget, the guy looked at the food and he says, we don't eat that kind of food. Yeah, I thought, ooh, I'm giving you free food. <laughs> so anyway, I thought, well, that little girl needs it. Whether you don't like it or not, the little girl does. So anyway, that kind of turned me off on him immediately. Sherry was pregnant at the time. She and Jean had a baby boy who they named Jean Cook Jr. Jean Jr. says he heard a story about he and his sister nearly setting their apartment on fire. Being dumb kids, we were playing with a lighter or something we found, but other than that, I mean, my, my, the memories I really have, the good memories were, um, like I said, playing in the house, and then I remember a couple memories of us, like, uh, sliding on slip and slides outside in the summertime. Ever find yourself almost all the way to work, or maybe you're out with family and friends, and you get that nagging feeling? Did I close the window? Did I lock that door? You just don't know, and it can drive you nuts. You don't have to worry about that when you've got Simply Safe home security at your place. It's a nice extra layer of protection to know Simply Safe is there. Simply Safe has an arsenal of sensors to protect your entire home and keep your family safe. Simply Safe got rid of everything that makes home security such a pain. There's no long-term contracts, no hidden fees, they won't gouge you. It's just $14.99 a month, that's three times less than what other companies charge. And here's some big news. Simply Safe has just released its brand new high definition security camera. This camera is different. It connects to your security system and sends your smartphone a video the second something happens at your home. You can see everything that's going on so you won't have to wonder anymore. Check out the new camera today. Go to simplysafe.com/suspect right now. That's simplysafe.com/suspect. S I M P L I safe.com 
slash suspect. Cindy Hardy, the woman who had worked for the Iowa Runaway Service when Sherry was a teenager, ended up crossing paths with Sherry again. Next thing I know, I have a case as a child protective investigator with Sherry. And it is because of her children. She had two kids, as I recall. And Jennifer, (laughs) when I went to investigate, she took to me like her mother. So what she would do is her mother was having problems because Jennifer would stop cars or cars would stop her and she would arrive home and it was always black guys driving her home from school. Now, now we know mom had no control and tried, obviously was, it was neglect, total neglect, or this child wouldn't have done this. Like it was doing it all the time. I remember telling her the mother she had to pay attention to what was going on and stop that and I just can't she was helpless just like as a teenager she was real spacey ditzy not a bad person you have to understand this a a, a good girl uh very inept as a parent totally inept as a parent but this was no case to get her out of the house Mom took care of her needs in terms of food. She went to school every day, that kind of thing. And the ch- the little one was being taken care of. A- and I had no evidence of sexual abuse. I just had evidence of neglect. Sherry says that's not true. Jennifer took one ride from a stranger. She was spanked and told to never do it again. And she never got in a car again. So I don't know what that lady's talking about. Because I know I get very defensive, too, when when people say stuff about me and my kids. It's like, excuse me, but you know what? That was my little girl, you know, and you get just talking. And she says Jennifer was never neglected. She points to a photo of Jennifer surrounded by Christmas presents. She's so neglected. Look at all them presents. That little girl, she's, mommy always spoiled her. That's my little girl there. Sherry and Jean separated, and she met Joseph Glenn, who went by the name Ace. It was me and Jennifer. I was at a gas station pumping gas. And he invited me to a party at his friend's house. And when I first met Joe, he was, I thought he was a womanizer. He just wanted to kiss, and, you know. But I kissed, and I told, told his girlfriend he was trying to come on to me. And next thing you know, I got him knocking at my front door telling me, I'm different than all the rest of them girls. I want to be with you. So they started dating, and Sherry soon moved with him 170 miles east to the Quad Cities where they eventually got married. Here I do, I moved to Quad Cities and meet Mary and Dee. <laughs> and they're like, God, there must be, she should have seems like a sweet girl, but there must be something wrong with her. <laughs> yeah. Mary Rockwell was friends with Ace's grandfather. That was Dee's exact word. She says, you know, that Sherry seems like a really nice girl, but what's wrong with her? I said, what do you mean what's wrong with her? And she said, well, she can't be right if she's with Joe. <laughs> I still remember, I forgot about yeah. that. Yeah, she was like... And me and Mary became friends after that. Mm-hmm. Constantly. Three blocks apart. Gene Jr. ended up living with his father. He's currently serving a 50-year sentence in an Iowa prison for charges of sexual abuse. His father served time in the 1990s for other charges. But Jennifer lived with Sherry and Ace in the Quad Cities. Mary spent a lot of time with the family and formed a special bond with Jennifer. She considers herself Jennifer's godmother. Jennifer was the cutest little girl tomboy you would ever see. And I always remember she would go out to play. She'd have on a dress and sandals and her hair in, you know, ponytails or whatever. She would come back. One sock would be gone. The hair would be disheveled. She, you know, she'd go out looking like a little princess and come home looking like a little boy. She loved Joe's motorcycle. She had a lot of friends. Um, loved to ride her bike. Jennifer also loved her newborn baby brother Damien, and counting down the days to her tenth birthday. I do remember though when Damien was born. That at first she, I had pictures of her going like this, because she was jealous at first. Then all of a sudden she's peeking over Joe, and she's got a new baby brother. And I remember when we come home, she said, 
it's going to be my birthday. I've got a new baby brother. Jennifer's best friend was Noel Trimble. Noel says neither of them had very many friends at school, but they became close because Noel's dad was good friends with Jennifer's stepfather. She says they used their imaginations a lot when they played together. Imaginary friends and stuffed animal committees, and we had our own little private club called Girls Club You Must Stay. Um, we would meet and we would have sessions, and of course, most of our members were stuffed animals, but. <laughs> You know, little we use our imagination, and you know we write stories. We love unicorns, and um, it was My Little Pony. Sherry and Ace moved around a lot, and Jennifer attended five different elementary schools in a two-year period. The last school she went to was Earl Hansen School in Rock Island. Jennifer had an IQ of 75. An IQ score of 70 or below is considered intellectually disabled. At Earl Hansen School, she saw a teacher's aide named Kathy Sellers for special education. Kathy remembers the week before Jennifer died. She had drawn a birthday picture for another little girl in Jennifer's class. As we were coming in from recess, she was swinging my arm and swinging her dress a little bit. But she says, uh, my birthday is coming up on Friday. And I said, I know it is. And she said, are you going to make me a picture too? And I said, well, of course. And she said, what's it going to be? I said, that's a surprise. Kathy also remembers the first time she met Jennifer. We were on a, a field trip, and we went over to Davenport to see the Nutcracker. And Jennifer, I told Jennifer she had to take my hand. And she pulled away, and I said, no, we need to go, you know, you need to take my hand. And when she did, I grabbed her hand, took her hand. She tried to bite me. I said, oh, that's good to have a coat on. <laughs> after, like I said, after she got to know me, she was fine. She just, she, I don't know, she just was a sweet little girl. Very innocent. She really never talked to me about her home life. And I, I never, I ever pushed the issue because if she didn't want to talk to me about it, I wasn't going to push it. You know, I figured that really isn't my business. But Mary Rockwell knew Jennifer wasn't growing up under the best circumstances. They had rats really bad, um, but it wasn't uncommon to hear the rats running in the bathroom or see one. I remember when they moved and they tore down their water bed. I had never seen a rat's nest before. They had two rats' nests under their waterbed. It was an impoverished neighborhood. In the late 1980s and early 90s, the Quad Cities were feeling the impact from the farm crisis. But Steve Hutchinson, who was a minister at Bethel Assembly of God Church in Rock Island, says the community was starting to recover. In any community, there are people that struggle and there is a poor side of town and so forth and it would seem that they probably fit into that poorer segment of an otherwise fairly prosperous community. Sarah Langenberg moved to the Quad Cities after she graduated from the University of Iowa in Iowa City. She remembers driving into Davenport for her job interview at the Quad City Times newspaper. And I remember driving into town with my for my first job interview and of course there was a little bit of big city, you know, the big drive down Harrison Street, as I recall. You know, it was four lanes. And the other thing that struck me was that it was a very, what I would call a blue collar. There are universities or colleges, St. Ambrose, Palmer College of Chiropractic, there, but they aren't like the dominant employer in the community. So it was a much different community. Rod Thompson, another reporter in the area, says the Quad Cities had not recovered by that time. He grew up in Flint, Michigan, and says the economic suffering in the Quad Cities at the time reflected the problems of families in Flint and Detroit after major economic turmoil caused by the auto industry. Maybe to a lesser degree, but maybe not. Um, where you had the changes in the farm industry and the farm implement industry that hurt a lot of people employment-wise, particularly people who didn't have a lot of skills otherwise. That's where they, they could make a decent living was... Uh, 
in manufacturing or support of the manufacturing. And so, you know, that has that trickle through the whole economy effect there. So then what happens is the, the poorer areas of a community, and that certainly includes that end of Rock Island, get hit the hardest, you know. And, and because of that, then you have the economic and social suffering and pain and uh, a certain amount of maybe despair and hopelessness. Despite the hard times, friends of Jennifer's stepfather say Ace liked to dream big. For example, he invited a swimming pool saleswoman to the house to get an estimate. Jeanette Carlson worked for Century Pool Company in Moline, Illinois. When I went over to that house, I, I thought, oh, wow, you know, I, I mean, you, there, it was all dirt. Everything was dirt back there, there, and it was just, when I went in the house, I was invited, invited in the house, there was the dad, Joseph Quinn, another black man, and another white man, and no furniture, nothing. Not, there was a big motorcycle chopper in the living room that took up almost the entire living room, and there, in one of the bedrooms there was clothes on one bed piled up probably as high as you could get a pile of clothes, like maybe five feet up in the air, and and that little girl had nothing but a smile on her face all the time. And they were all sitting there on the couch, and I turned around and I walked out the door because I thought, I'm not staying in here, you know. And when I went out, she came out the door, and she said, can I ask you a question? And I said, and she, I knew her name was Jennifer. She had told me that, and she was just a little, tiny little thing. And I always told my husband, I said, she had just this little pumpkin smile, just with a little gap between her teeth and that. And she said, no, I better not ask you because I'm not supposed to ask anybody but family or close friends. And I said, all right. And I said, but, you know, if you want to ask me, you can go ahead and ask me. And she said, can I have 50 cents? And I said, what do you, what do you need some money for? She said, I'd like to go site buy some bubble gum. And I said, okay. And so I went and I got her two quarters, and she said, please. And Sherry told me that she'd gotten her, her cabbage patch doll, and it was in the casket with her. Cabbage patch doll, yeah. We buried her with the cabbage patch doll. Steve Hutchinson of Bethel Church preached at the funeral. We've had lots of funerals where people have been buried with certain things of memorabilia. It was hers. It was her gift. And uh, it represented her. Children from Jennifer's school sang her favorite song, If You're Happy and You Know It. This past September, Sherry and Mary went to Chippeonic Cemetery in Rock Island on what would have been Jennifer's 36th birthday. How many do we have? Any? Uh, we got 22, 23, 24. They released balloons with messages to Jennifer. I put Damien, your baby brother, because she was all into her baby brother. They gathered around her headstone to pray and to remember the little girl with such a big smile. Lord, today we come humbly before you, thanking you for all of our blessings, all of our loved ones on heaven and earth. Today's a special day. It would be Jennifer's 36th birthday, and I know she is happy. I know she is celebrating in heaven. She is each and every one of us as guardian angel at this point. Lord, we're here to remember Jennifer, her happy times, and the miraculous birth that she had. We know she rests comfortably in your arms, God, until we see her. Next time on Suspect Convictions, we'll look at the evidence that led to Stanley's convictions. She had seen Stanley's car down there at the time of the fire. Along with the potential problems in the prosecution's case. There was the interstate jurisdictional issues, the suppression issues, and there were a lot of evidentiary issues. Stanley Liggins has always proclaimed his innocence. You have nothing to do with no, the death. No, ma'am, not guilty. That's next time on Suspect Convictions. Production assistance comes from Alfredo Monteca. 
thanks to WVIK CEO Jay Pierce and WVIK staff Jared Johnson, Michelle O'Neill, Herb Trix, and Dave Garner. All archived audio was generously provided by WQAD-TV Channel 8 in the Quad Cities.